Good morning, everyone. So we'll be starting the our, our course, the novel separation process, and uh, we'll be this is the first lecture. As I uh, told you earlier, that this this lecture will be on the fundamentals of the separation processes, and uh, broadly we'll look into um, uh, the uh, driving force of separation processes and the kind types of separation process in general, and we'll identify the novel separation the, the separation processes which can be categorized as novel separation processes. And uh, later on, we'll just take one by one various separation processes and uh, do the detailed study. So basically, separation processes are uh, are are integral part of any uh, any process flow sheet. Okay. So any separation and any any detailed uh, process flow sheet of any industrial process, separation processes are integral part. Okay. Now. they can either put in the downstream or upstream units okay either upstream or downstream that means in any if you talk about a reactive system okay some where some reaction is going on so uh, let us say uh, we, we ca carry out some reaction and there are some products now in this process the reactor becomes the heart of the system right now suppose in the in this reactive system we are, we are using a gas which we, which may be laden with moisture and we like to separate the moisture and moisture free gas will be a feed to the reactor so in this case you have to have a separatory unit in the upstream of the system to remove the moisture okay for removal this is an example only removal of moisture from feed gas one has to put a separator or separation unit in upstream of process flow sheet that means the separator should come first followed by the reactor and then the other processes now another example where the downstream separation process will occur the down in the downstream of the process we put the separator is that suppose you have a uh, mixture of re, uh, products now in this case and you are identify to take out one particular product from a mixture of 3 to 3 to 4 products okay then you have to put a separator in the downstream of the process flow sheet so in this case the uh, you have to put a separator in the downstream okay 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 downstream of the process now if you talk about a an effluent treatment plant an effluent treatment plant separator or the separation process or separatory unit is the heart of the plant so there are several types of separation that one can think of in an effluent treatment plant primary okay secondary and tertiary in the primary you use coagulation coagulant flocculant okay so what is the difference between coagulant and flocculant in coagulant you use some material for example ferric chloride or you know uh, potassium or calcium oxide depending on the ph of the effluent add some coagulant now, what this coagulant will do these coagulants are basically charged colloids and they will attract the solute of opposite polarity and they will form a uh, heavier uh, means uh, heavier conglomerate and that will deposit at the uh, at the bottom of the tank so that is the coagulant and what is flocculant flocculant will be almost same thing but it will be floating in the liquid so flocculant laden material has to be taken out from the top of the reactor 
okay and the coagulant um, uh, um, and after coagulation the total solids will be taken from the bottom there is a difference between coagulation and flocculation that, that these are basically the primary separator separation processes in any effluent treatment plant now if you go for the secondary units after the, this primary treatment one has to go for the secondary unit here basically biological processes will be taken into place will be take, will be taking into place for example biological oxidation pond where there is a huge pond there you put the material and and uh, uh, the effluent and uh, oxygen will be supplied in different you know uh, mechanical arrangements for example you may be having porous pipe where the air is being flown in and oxygen will be taken out always in the form of the bubbles so there will be a rapid mixing and so on and so forth so biological oxygen uh, biological degradation will occur in that and after that the clarified liquid will go to a tertiary unit so there will be a biological oxidation pond in case of secondary treatment and in case of tertiary treatment you are it's they are called polish polishing steps so you are basically polishing the the effluent and removing the trace amount of solute solids those are play, those are still there in the effluent by various processes like adsorption membrane separations so on so forth okay so there are three distinct separators separation processes they, those will be occurring in a typical effluent treatment plant primary secondary and tertiary and uh, basically in an effluent treatment plant if all the processes processes are nothing but the separation processes okay then suppose you would like to separate uh, the the very various components present in a mixture present in a mixture or a solution for example a salt solution okay it's 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 typically a solution right or there is a mixture of various components which are naturally occurring now what you would like to do you would like to separate out these components from a natural naturally occurring material substance okay the, what is a substance it is a mixture so you must be putting something from outside some external agent into the system that will cause separation of the individual units or individual components what will, what that can, that can be that can be a material or that can be an energy okay so one has to put either energy or matter or material to effect separation for example you if this is the if this is the separator unit and this is the feed stream this is the product stream then there must be some un, in, in input to the system for in the form of either energy or matter okay so this is the basic flow sheet of any separation process and i will give some 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 examples for example if we talk about distillation the what is the external agent so this is basically the external agent that will affect that, that that will affect separation okay now for example distillation in case of distillation we give thermal energy how we are, we are, in, we are uh, uh, giving thermal energy in the form of reboiler so reboiler is basically the source that provides thermal energy for the separation in distillation in case of evaporation again it is not a matter it is a therm it is it is energy in the form of thermal energy that will be leading to separation of gas from the liquid vapor from the liquid and what is the what is the uh, you know unit that will be giving the thermal energy in this case it is heat exchanger right
and in case of distillation it is reboiler. Separation, another example is separation of solids. including a magnetic material like iron. If that is the case, then magnetic energy can be, can be utilized for separation of iron from a mixture of various solids. Okay. Now, now, these are the various you know uh, um, uh, examples of where, where the external agent is energy. Now, I will give you some of the examples where the external agent is matter. Matter that will lead to separation. For example, coagulation, coagulation flocculation, you are adding some external material to the system. Like ferric chloride is another is a, is a coagulant, potassium. calcium oxide of various doses. Now, you know uh, these are various and external materials that will be matters that will be added into the system to affect coagulation, flocculation, so on and so forth. There are some flocculating agents are there which will be causing flocculation. Now, uh, just uh, for a diversion I would like to say that uh, which type of coagulant you will select to affect uh, separation. Now, whether you will be using a ferric chloride or whether you will be using a calcium oxide or whether you will be using a potassium that will be typically depending on the pH of the solution that you are going to treat. So, pH of the solution is, become, is very vital when uh, that will dictate the type of material type of coagulant that we are going to use. For example, if you, an, if you have a basic pH that is pH greater than 7, then obviously, the choice will be ferric chloride or potassium which are basically acidic in nature. So, that the final pH of the treated effluent will be close to normal pH that is around 7. Similarly, if you have some acidic pH that is less than 7, example of a basic pH is uh, um, uh, textile effluent, dye containing textile effluent which will be having a pH in the order of around 10 to 12 it will be having a very high basic pH for, because of the presence of sodium hydroxide and uh, other materials present in that system. On the other hand, if you talk about a pickling effluent in a tannery plant, pickling is basically uh, a treatment process, a unit process in a tannery where there are lots of acid is uh, you know added to the system and the effluent that is generated out of this unit is, is known as the pickling effluent and it is highly acidic. In this case, the, uh, uh, the coagulants like ferric chloride or potassium will not, will not do. In that case, the coagulant like calcium oxide will be good. Okay. So, in the, in the case of acidic pH, you can use calcium oxide so that it will, be, it will be basic in nature and the final pH of the solution will come to close to neutral pH. Okay. And it is always good to have a uh, have an effluent at neutral pH. Suppose you are having an effluent after treatment, which will be having a pH in the acidic range or the, in the basic range, that will be very dangerous if you uh, discharge it into surface water or in the river stream. Okay. So for that, you have to have a t another unit operation that is for pH adjustment. So there, you have to either add alkali or you know base, depending upon the situation, to bring the pH of the solution to the normal pH. That particular step is called neutralization. So, you must be having a another step called neutralization, another unit operation called neutralization at the end step after if the solution becomes highly basic or acidic. So, it is better to have a coagulant or flocculant which will lead to a solution which will be all close to normal pH. Okay. 
Another example of external agent as matter is membrane based separation processes. What is this membrane? Membrane is basically a phase that will dictate the, uh, the um, basically the relative you know different magnitude of transport rate of various species. Okay. So, depend because of the various you know difference in the rate of transport of various species, one species will be preferentially transported to the other side. So, the downstream of the membrane will be concentrated you know in one particular species and the upstream will be concentrated in a particular species. That is why the separation will be occurring due in the presence of a membrane. We will we'll be going in detail of the of this uh, membrane based separation processes. So, therefore, the external agent is again a material a matter called membrane. Okay. This is an example of external agent being a material. We have examples of uh, you know separation where the external agent is energy in the form of thermal energy, magnetic energy, so on and so forth. Okay. Next, we define a factor called separation factor. Physically, it signifies the extent of separation. Okay. What is the extent of separation? 30 percent separation, 40 percent separation, 90 percent separation. So, it is uh, defined by a quantity called alpha i j which is defined as x i 1 divided by x j 1 divided by x i 2 divided by x j 2. Okay. Here i and j are two species and 1 and 2 are two streams. Okay. So, basically we are talking about two species to be separated from two streams. Okay. Now, uh, it, it, one, it, it, it will be basically the this gives a relative unit that, that means, one stream is concentrated more in a particular species compared to the other stream. So, it cannot be absolute. So, it will be always relative. So, if I talk about the between two streams, one stream number 2 is concentrated in species i that means, the amount amount of the species i is more in that particular stream compared to the other stream. So, it is basically always comparative. Now, if alpha i j is equal to 1, that, that simply indicates no separation. Okay. There is no separation between the salt and the, and, and the uh, well, let us say salt and the water okay, in, in, a, in a saline solution. And alpha i j less than 1 indicates stream 1 is concentrated in j in component j and stream 2 is concentrated in species i okay. and alpha i j greater than 1 indicates that stream 1 is concentrated in i and stream 2 is concentrated in j okay so so one so it is it is like uh, it is more or less like relative volatility type of definition in case of distillation if you remember so depending on the concentrations of various species present in various streams one can identify the value of uh, separation factor and looking into the value of separation factor whether it is um, whether it is a fraction or whether it is greater than 1, one can come to a conclusion that which stream will be concentrated will be will be more concentrated in a particular species which stream is less concentrated in a, with respect to a particular species. Now, broadly 
there are two categories of any separation processes. Broad categories, now let us try to identify uh, the broad classifications of separation processes. What are these broad categories? One is equilibrium governed separation process. Another is red governed separation processes. So, there are two broad categories of separation process one is equilibrium governed separation processes and the another is red governed separation processes. Uh, what is the equilibrium governed separation processes? In this case, the product streams are in equilibrium with the inlet streams. That means, once the equilibrium is reached, the product cannot be more concentrated compared to the equilibrium concentration. That means, if you if you remember the equilibrium diagram of various mixtures. Okay. So, equilibrium will dictate the maximum limit of separation in these cases. Now, the conventional separation processes those you have already uh, studied in the unit operations of chemical engineering you know courses for example, distillation, absorption, adsorption, drying etcetera all are they fall under the equilibrium, equilibrium governed separation processes. So, equilibrium there is a particular equilibrium of the of a particular species in, in two phases. Okay, in vapor phase and liquid phase or two streams that will dictate the maximum limit of the separation process. Equilibrium governs maximum limit of separation. On the other hand, the red governed separation processes are basically the difference in transport rate of various species dictates separation, difference of transport rates where in the separation medium. Okay, for example, uh, most of the membrane based separation processes are red governed separation processes. Okay. Suppose, you are you would like to separate a saline salt out of water using a reverse osmosis membrane. So, in that case the transport of salt through the membrane will be extremely small compared to the transport of you know rate of transport of solvent that is water through the membrane because water, water molecules are much small in size. So, therefore, in the downstream unit in downstream size or, the, or in the permeate side the concentration of salt will be very very less compared to the upstream or the feed side. So, that that will so transport of these two particular species through the separating medium will dictate the amount of extent of separation. Okay. So, in the permeate stream or the downstream will be dilute as far as the salt is concerned on the other hand the upstream will be or the feed side will be con more concentrated in case of uh, you know compared to uh, with, with respect to salt. Now, we will just talk about various separation processes and their characterizations starting from equilibrium governed separation processes. Let us look into the uh, equilibrium governed separation processes and some of the examples and their characteristics. For example, distillation. The first characteristic is it is based on difference in boiling point. Okay. So, difference in boiling point of the species will dictate the distillation, distillation operation, the extent of separation during distillation. Component 
with lower boiling point goes to vapor phase earlier. That is quite obvious. Okay. Now, the third characteristic is that some vapor which will be coming out from the top of the column are, co are condensed, they are liquefied and sent back through the column. Okay. what it does. So, therefore, there will be a counter current operation, the liquid liquid is coming from the top and vapor is going from the bottom. Okay. During this counter current operation, there will be tremendous, there will be very good mixing of the liquid, liquid and the vapor and the one particular species may be transferred more into the vapor phase, okay, which will be having lower boiling point. So, there will be good contact, there will be more transfer, but this transfer. So, if you talk about uh, you know various in fact, in a liquid in a distillation column, there are various stages. Now, if you talk about a particular stage, the liquid is coming from the top, the vapor, vapor is going, the going from the bottom and the compositions are always in equilibrium. That is the maximum possible separation one can achieve. So, if, when we are talking about the, uh, you know, um, uh, the equilibrium composition exist between the inlet and outlet, it is not the overall the total column it will be on the differential small stages inside the column. So, at every location the, 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 you know, um, the equilibrium will exist between the incoming and outgoing streams okay. that will dictate the extent of separation in a distillation column. Now, the distillation column the uh, external agent as we have discussed earlier is reboiler. The external agent is reboiler. Reboiler is basically the equipment that will be supplying thermal energy for separation. Okay, let us look into some of the applications. Of distillation, the applications are separation of organic solvents for example you know benzene toluene xylene etc and there are other applications of distillation also they are, you know depending on the you know their their, their boiling point and how the uh, boiling points are uh, whether the boiling points are close or they are you know far apart Okay, depending that will be depending on the situation and uh, depending on that the uh, you know extent of separation or the efficiency of the process will be dictated. Okay. Another, another process is absorption. I think these are very common to the chemical engineering student, but since there are lots of students uh, uh, you know, uh, from the other departments, I would like to just give a small introduction on various processes those will be occurring in the under the you know category of equilibrium governed separation processes okay. and red governed separation process will be coming after that. Absorption is basically solute is transferred from vapor phase and absorbed in liquid phase. Okay. Suppose you are there is a there is a uh, solute that is present in the vapor form and you would like to uh, preferentially extract one that particular solute in some medium. Okay, the medium may be a liquid phase where the solute concentration will be absolutely low. So there will be a typical concentration gradient that will be existing of the solute between the vapor phase and liquid phase, and the solute will be coming to the vapor phase and it will be uh, in the liquid phase and it will be dissolved there. It is called absorption, and since this is occurring throughout the whole bulk of the solution absorption is a bulk phenomena. 
that is the first characteristic absorption is a bulk phenomena okay the solute that we are going to get in the liquid phase uh, you, there are several methods to get out of the liquid and uh, you know recover solutes okay the solutes in the liquid phase can be recovered by expelling liquids you know there are several methods for that and these liquids can be recycled okay so here in this particular case it is not an energy a matter is introduced in this particular separation right what is that matter the liquid the solvent okay a, and most of the absorptions are generally they occur in norm, under normal conditions at the room temperature okay a matter is introduced into the system system to effect separation. What is that system? It is basically liquid solvent. And why it is equilibrium separation process? Because there exists, there exists an equilibrium of solute concentration across the interface of liquid and vapor okay across the interface there of, of, there is a there is a uh, you know solute distribution that will occur it, it, so that 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 distribution will be ruled under the uh, equilibrium conditions so it is basically the again the equilibrium that will dictate the maximum separation or maximum solubilization of the solute from the vapor into the liquid phase so again that will be it is a case of equilibrium government separation process and the uh, it, it, it is the liquid solvent that will be basically uh, causing the separation okay uh, I will give you an example of the absorption process. Uh, for example, removal of carbon dioxide from air CO2 mixture. Okay. So, one can use using primary secondary or tertiary amines. Amines are liquid compounds or solvents, maybe primary, secondary, tertiary, there are different kinds of amines are available, which are basically liquid solvents. They will preferentially absorb carbon dioxide from a mixture. From the air water, air carbon dioxide mixture, only carbon dioxide, when they are in coming in contact with the amines, amines solvent, solvent amine. Uh, between air and carbon dioxide only carbon dioxide will be preferentially absorbed into the into the amine okay this absorption can be can be uh, reactive absorption can be a non reactive absorption in case of non reactive absorption the amount the, the solute will be tra getting transformed and it will be dissolved into the, uh, into the into the liquid stream as a bulk phenomena on the case of on the on the other hand in case of reactive absorption the solute will be coming into the liquid phase into the solvent phase and it will be reacting with the solvent itself or it can react with a particular component that is present in the solvent okay for example, uh, uh, if, if, a, if a particular species will be coming to the solvent and there is a particular species which, you, which will be reacting with the solute 
okay, it will be reacting with the solute and it will create a new compound. So, what is the effect? The effect is in the downstream in the solvent side, the concentration of the particular solute will become 0. So, you can maintain always a maximum concentration gradient between the gaseous phase and the liquid phase. So, if it is a reactive absorption, the solute will be coming from the gas phase or the vapor phase into the liquid phase and it will be reacting with the, with the material or the solvent itself. So, the concentration of the solute in the liquid stream becomes 0. So, one can maintain the maximum concentration gradient in that case and as far as the equilibrium means at the interface, the uh, 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 you know, rate of transfer of the solutes will be governed. Okay. Then we come to the case of another equilibrium governed separation process that is adsorption. It is basically the transport of gas or liquid species on a solid surface. The, for example, some uh, organics are adsorbed on activated carbon species, okay, activated carbon surface. So, adsorption compared to the absorption, adsorption is entirely a surface phenomena. In the, on the other hand, the absorption, whatever we have uh, just discussed uh, right now, the absorption is a bulk phenomena and adsorption is a surface phenomena. So, first characteristic of adsorption is that it is a surface phenomena. The solutes get adsorbed on solid surface and it is basically it, it will be attached on the solid surface by several you know physicochemical processes maybe hydrogen bonding on the surface or there are another another is that there are fine pores present within the adsorbent okay so generally adsorbents are very porous so there are fine pores present in the adsorbent in the in the adsorbent itself and through these pores the the solute will be just entering into these pores these are called pore diffusion hydrogen bonding on the surface pore diffusion inside the pores Okay. So, for, for example, it can be a uh, liquid solid system. What is a liquid solid system? Uh, the liquid solid system is basically for example, if you would like to remove any organic, okay, organics like phenol, some dyes, okay, maybe reactive dyes like methylene blue, crystal violet or orange, red orange, so there are so many dyes. Okay and the adsorbent is called is, is let us say activated carbon. Activated carbon contains lots of pores and it will be having you know generally the surface of the uh, typically it is it is normally done that we, we try to make the surface of the adsorption such that it has a opposite polarity compared to the Polar, polar solute. If you have a polar solute, for example, alcohol or something, those, those are all polar solute, right? Now, if you have a, a surface of the adsorbent of the opposite polarity, opposite charge, then the bonding will be, the adsorption will be, will be more. Okay. There may, and and uh, for example, in, in the activated carbon, the mostly the surface are negatively charged. How you know the surface is positively charged or negatively charged? There is a particular test. It is called uh, uh, point of zero charge method. PH ZPC zero point charge. Okay, now there is a particular method which exists, uh, and uh, using that method, one can find out what is the PH where the the uh, the uh, 
the adsorbent is neutral. So, you can set your operating pH above that neutral pH that is ZPC pH, it, that it becomes positively charged, it, it becomes negatively charged. If you set your operating pH below the ZPC point, then it will be positively charged. So, one can make the surface charged as per your wish by changing or operating the pH of the solution. But before that, you have to identify the ZPC point or the ZPC pH of the adsor adsorbent. Okay. The solute is called adsorbate and the material like activated carbon or something, it is called adsorbent. So, adsorbent, the zero point charge of the adsorbent has to be determined first. You can set your operating pH above the you know uh, ZPC point or below the ZPC point depending upon the charge of the polarity of the solute. So, if you do that, then the solute will be adsorbed more on the solvent or on, on, the, on the solid surface on the adsorbent. Also, there is pore diffusion. So, there is maybe a competition of the pore diffusion and surface attachment and maybe a surface diffusion and um, uh, because the, the solutes will be coming and sitting on the surface, it can immediately move either to the interior or over the surface itself. So, there may be a surface diffusion, there may be interior pore diffusion as well as there will be external attachment by hydrogen bonding or chemical bonding or it is something called chemisorption. If chemical bonding is more prevalent, that adsorption is known as a chemisorption, otherwise it is known as physical adsorption. By looking into the value of the delta H of the process, one can uh, come to a conclusion whether it is a chemical chemisorption or, or physical adsorption, probably that value will be around uh, 10 calorie, 10 or 12 calorie per mole, something like that. If it is less than that, then it is called physical adsorption, otherwise it is chemical adsorption, something like that. So, there is a there is a criteria existing by looking into the delta H value, which will be dictating whether it will be physical adsorption or chemical adsorption. Another example of equilibrium govern process is drying. You know, drying is basically, and you, it, the the uh, it is not a matter. So in the in the earlier process, in the in the case of adsorption, what is what is causing the separation? Whether it's a matter or energy, it is matter that is causing separation in case of adsorption, and the matter is adsorbent. In case of drying, it is energy that causes separation. It is basically the thermal energy. Okay. Now, let us come. So, these are basically some, some of the common equilibrium based separation processes that we come across in chemical engineering uh, 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 you know stream. And then now, let us look into the red governed separation processes. Now, in red governed separation process, the basic characteristic is difference in transport rates of various species through the medium, separating medium medium is basically separating medium under external driving force. For example, osmosis and reverse osmosis. In case of osmosis, the external driving force is the concentration difference. In case of reverse osmosis, it is the pressure difference that will be causing the that will be the external driving force. Because of that, there will be difference in transport of various species. For example, uh, the the salt saline water I was talking about the um, uh, the, the uh, transport rate of salt through the the separating medium or the reverse osmosis membrane will be much much less compared to the transport of the solvent that is water. So, in the downstream it will be it will be uh, uh, it will be stripped of salt in the upstream it will be enriched in salt. Okay. So, this, this is, these are basically red governed separation processes and in general the driving force of red governed separation process is for, for, for that matter in any separation process the driving force is the gradient of chemical potential.
okay delta mu by delta x okay if the thickness there is a separating medium will be extremely small the driving force will be extremely high okay and the chemical this this is the, the uh, thickness of separate separating medium this chemical potential and if you just brush up your thermodynamics chemical potential is a function of pressure concentration temperature and electrochemical potential okay so there are three components of there are four components of chemical potential pressure concentration temperature electrochemical potential that means if there there may be transport occurring because of the difference in either any of these four factors by by or by any of these two factors by any of these three factors or any of these four factors that means and and the rate will be dictated according to that, that means rate will be having uh, the contributions from the difference in all these four factors if all these four are varying suppose you are talking about a system where um, it is isothermal okay that means the temperature gradient will be zero so in that case other three will contribute okay and uh, you know let us let us talk about some of this so e even if there is one or more of such you know causes will be present as a gradient that means gradient is not equal to zero there will be transfer of a species across the separating medium and these values will be having different effects on different solutes present in the system this difference of rates of transport of solutes will cause the separation in a red governed separation process okay for example osmosis now let us look into the difference of osmosis and reverse osmosis that will clarify some of our ideas and we will also you know uh, discuss all these issues in greater detail when we talk about the membrane based separation processes suppose there are two chambers it is filled up with water okay and it is separated by a semi permeable barrier this is a semi permeable barrier okay why it is called semi permeable because it will allow out of the two species let's say uh, salt and water it will allow only one particular species to transport to, to get transported through it to for, for uh, and and the other species will be retained by it so it is called it is called ideal semi permeable barrier now what we do we add some salt here so this is called solution side and this is the solvent side and solvent is basically nothing but water and the solution is basically water plus salt now the salt concentration is less in this chamber and the salt concentration is more in the solvent side so therefore there will be a transport and since it is semi permeable barrier it will allow only solvent to pass through it it will not allow salt to permeate through it so therefore more water will be passing from the solvent side to the solution side so in the effect the height of the solvent side will be decreasing and height of the solution side will be increasing and this process will continue unless and until the activity of solvent activity of solvent that means activity of water will become equal on both the sides or chemical potential of water will will become equal on both the sides okay so this will and and this process will continue unless there will be equ equality of activity of water on both the sides and at that case let us say there will be a difference in 
rho, there will be difference in height. If you convert that height difference into pressure by multiplying it by rho and gravity, that will that will cause you that will basically the osmotic pressure of the system. Now, osmotic pressure is a colligative property. What is a colligative property? Colligative property means some quantity which will be some property of the liquid which will be function of its concentration, the amount, the concentration. So, if you put more salt here, the concentration of water will be much, much less on this side in the solution side. So, more sol solvent or more water will be permitting from the solvent side to the solution side. So, in that case, the height difference will be more because more solvents will be passed. So, this height will be further lowered and this height will be further uh, you know more increased and your osmotic pressure will be higher. So, therefore, depending on the concentration, the osmotic pressure will increase and the relationship between osmotic pressure and the concentration of the solute will be ever increasing. Okay. So, more concentration, more osmotic pressure and of course, for a pure distilled water, there, where there is no solute present, the osmotic pressure is 0. So, in this case, the concentration difference is the driving force. And it is it is basically osmotic equilibrium that will be dictating the process. Dictates the process. On the case of reverse osmosis, what we do? Suppose in the in the, the earlier diagram this is the solution side this is the solvent side in a normal osmosis process the flow of solvent will be from solvent side to the solution side in the reverse osmosis press process we apply pressure from outside on the solution side and try to push out solvent from it so therefore the permeate side in this case will be more in solvent that will be pure water you will be you are going to get and in the case of retentate of the solution side it will be it will be getting on concentrated. So, we since we are it is just opposite reverse of the osmosis process process we call it a reverse osmosis process. So, in this case pressure gradient is the driving force right more pressure you will be giving the more solutes solvent will be ejected out of the solvent side. So, del pressure gradient is the driving force. Okay. So, uh, so, let us stop it for uh, today and uh, tomorrow what we will be doing will be we will be studying some more characteristics of the red governed separation processes and look into other uh, you know driving forces for example, you know temperature difference, electrochemical potential difference and then we will try to summarize the you know between uh, equilibrium governed separation process and red governed separation process to identify which separation process should be categorized as a novel separation process for further discussion. Okay.